With the eyes of our hearts enlightened, we see the greatness of Christ's power at work in us and the world. God put this power to work in Christ when God raised him from the dead and seated him at God's right hand in the glory of the heavenly places. We are witnesses. The Lord is risen. Clap your hands, all you peoples. God has gone up with a shout of joy. Trusting in God's faithfulness to us, let us repent of those things that have drawn us away from God and our neighbors, that we may experience again the joy of forgiveness. Let us pray together. Holy One, lover of humankind, you have asked us to proclaim your name to all people. We confess that we have held back from doing that shy and self-conscious. Forgive us, we pray, and empower us in Jesus' name. Amen. The promise of our faith is that we are already forgiven, and in Christ's name, given the power to rise up and overcome all that separates us from God and from one another. Receive the Holy Spirit and be empowered to be witnesses of God's resurrection power in Jesus Christ. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let all their songs employ the fields and floods, rocks Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the 
Good morning. The grace and peace of the Lord be with you and yours on this Lord's Day. Welcome to worship from the sanctuary of Catonsville Presbyterian Church. A copy of our order of worship may be found online at our website, catonsvillepress.org, as well as on our Facebook page. Again, welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. Just so, several announcements we want to lift up. A reminder, next Sunday will be and is Pentecost Sunday. Ordinarily, we would all be here wearing red, but we invite you to wear some red at home as you join us for worship. That's next Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. Looking ahead, uh, next week, we, the messenger will be going out, and in this issue of the messenger, you will find detailed information about plans to slowly, slowly gradually return to some form of in-person worship here at CPC over the summer months. And all of the details will be there uh, in the messenger, so be sure to look for it. And finally, Debbie Anderson has an announcement for us, uh, the latest from the Columbarium Committee. And uh, we are grateful to Debbie and, and everyone on this committee for all the hard work they're doing. Debbie. Good morning. I'm here to bring you a minute for Columbarium. We've received zoning approval and are moving forward with building our columbarium and creating its surrounding sacred space garden. Both will be located across from the handicap ramp on Beechwood Avenue. The columbarium will provide 80 double niches for the cremated remains of CPC members and their extended family. The sacred space garden will be in front of the columbarium and will feature landscaping, benches, and ambient lighting, creating a peaceful space for contemplation and remembering. The congregation is invited to participate in creating this sacred space garden by purchasing engraved paper, pavers like this one. You may purchase a paver to honor a living loved one or remembering those who are no longer with us. You could also choose to lift up an appropriate text, which could be a Bible verse, poem, or quote. The pavers can be engraved with up to six lines of writing. That's 20 characters, including spaces. And please remember that the actual writing on the pavers should reflect the grace and dignity of the sacred space garden. The deadline for ordering the first group of pavers has been extended to June 30th. Pavers will be available after that date, but ordering prior will enable us to sell them as the garden is being constructed. On a more personal note, I'm very excited about this project. And I wanna give a special shout out to Jeannie Mueller for all of her hard work and dedication to get this project going. I can remember her approaching me and dad one morning in worship, wondering what we thought of the idea. And while my mom didn't know about it before she passed, my father was very excited and we couldn't think of a more appropriate place for he and mom. They will eternally be in the place they loved so much and I will be able to visit and reflect at a location that holds such special meaning for my family. And the Sacred Space Garden is a perfect place for me to have a dedication to my sister. Her peaceful place was at the beach, but placing a memorial brick in the garden gives me an opportunity to honor her here at our family church. I also thought about dedicating a brick for all the hard work, love, and caring that goes into the child care center. It feels like just yesterday that I was dropping my children off there. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to any one of us on the committee or email us at contactcolumbarium at catonsvilleprez.org. Thank you very much for your time this morning. If you were listening to the words of the hymn, you might have heard a very strange story. You may remember that we have already celebrated Easter. Jesus had died and then came alive again on Easter. He spent some time walking, talking, eating, breaking bread with his friends. And then we get to today's story. 
where Jesus goes up into heaven. And I have kind of a cool book that has a great picture, and you'll see why I like it when I open it up. There we go. This is what one artist thought it would look like. It says, Jesus gathered with his disciples, told them he was going to heaven, and he said goodbye to them. I look at those disciples and I wonder what they were thinking. I imagine they were a little sad. They were probably a little scared. I don't think most of us like it when someone we love and care about says they're going away. But here's what we know. Before he went away, Jesus told his friends, I will not leave you alone. I am sending the Holy Spirit to be with you. So what we are going to do next week on Pentecost is we are going to celebrate that gift of the Holy Spirit. So I'm just hoping we can get ready for it. I think you might have heard Ken saying you might want to wear something red. I'm going to have a ribbon so that I can wave it when we tell the story because red is the color of Pentecost. And also, for families with younger children, I'm going to be sending something home. So watch your mail. The Holy Spirit looks like many things. It looks like wind. It looks like fire that doesn't hurt on top of people's heads. It looks like a dove. So please watch your mailbox, because I'm going to send a piece of origami paper, special paper, and instructions so you can fold yours into a dove. And if you are a household that is not one with young children, but you want this too, please just send me an email right away and I will get that in the mail to you too, all right? So Jesus has said goodbye, but he has made a promise. Next week, we're going to celebrate the Holy Spirit. Get ready. Let us pray. Enlighten the eyes of our hearts, O God, and grant us a spirit of wisdom and revelation. In these words, let us hear your word. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. This morning we are going to sing together our first scripture, Psalm 47.
And let us continue to listen for God's word as it comes to us from the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Listen for what the Spirit says to the church. In the first book, Theophilus, meaning the Gospel of Luke, in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While, they, while staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and the cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Last Thursday was a major feast in the liturgical calendar of the Western Church. Although, to be honest, I have a feeling that there were many of us, many Protestants, especially those in the Reformed tradition, that probably ignored it altogether. It was that day, the feast day of the Ascension of the Lord. Now, to be honest, the Ascension, or even Ascension Sunday, wasn't part of my experience growing up as a Presbyterian in New Jersey. And the same was true for Dorothy growing up across the river in New York. Now, I certainly knew, we certainly knew about the story recounted by Luke here in the book of Acts. And it's really only in Acts, if you don't count the reference to it in Mark 16, which was related much later to the gospel. So we certainly knew about the story, but I never really paid much attention to it and really didn't know what to do with it. Now, I was really surprised to discover, though, the year that I lived in Europe, that the seventh Sunday, or excuse me, the seventh Thursday of Easter was a major church and national holiday, even a bank holiday, for most of Europe. Not in Presbyterian Scotland, mind you, but for the most of continental Europe. In fact, I remember traveling through France with my dear friends Lawson and Sheila Brown around this very time 30 years ago, and I couldn't figure out why on that day, why all the shops and all the restaurants and the museums and all the banks were closed on a Thursday in May. It's because it was Ascension Day. Some places close down on Thursday and Friday and then make a long weekend of it. Why not? 
This is a wonderful example of the way modern, extremely secular Europe actually lives on a Christian base within a Christian framework. You can see this on any given Sunday in Europe. The majority of Europeans never darken the door of a church and are marginally Christian. But Sunday remains a Sabbath. Shops and restaurants are closed. People rest. They don't work. They spend time with family and friends and picnic outdoors when the weather is good. When I was walking across Spain on the, on the Camino, I always had to make sure that when I got to a Saturday, I had to figure out where I was going to be on Sunday because I knew that everything would be closed, so I had to make sure that I had food to eat on a Sunday. Ascension of the Lord was one of the major feasts of the church reaching back to at least the fourth century. Yet it was largely forgotten by most Protestants, even though we confess in the Apostles' Creed, Christ ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Its inclusion in the Creed suggests that it was a foundational part of the Christian tradition. But it's not immediately clear at least to many today, why it's so significant. And what do we make of this story? A literal reading of the ascension is problematic. The cosmology or worldview of Luke is so foreign to the way we understand the world today. In the first century, heaven, heaven was and is the dwelling place of God, heaven was up there, up there in the heavens. The blue sky that we see up there was considered the floor of the heavens. Jesus' departure into heaven was conceived, there, conceived therefore, as being literally taken up, a literal ascension. The text is shaped by a pre-scientific cosmology. We now know that above that wonderful blue sky is an enormous universe that is at this very moment rapidly expanding, an expanding universe that is moving so fast at such a dizzying speed. So where exactly then is this heaven? Biblical scholar James Dunn describes the ascension as, at best, a puzzle and, at worst, an embarrassment for an age that no longer conceives of a physical heaven located above the earth. Douglas Farrow, who teaches at McGill University in Canada, says, in modern times, the ascension is seen less as the climax of the mystery of Christ than as something of an embarrassment in the age of the telescope and space probe, an idea that conjures up an outdated cosmology. If we set these different cosmologies aside, we might be able to see perhaps the deeper theological claim in this story. We could say that the text reflects a paradox that the early church, the early post-Easter church had, come to, had to come to terms with. That Jesus was absent and yet at the same time present. Yes, they knew that Jesus would come again, Jesus will come again, and yet at the same time, he was, he is also here. So the ascension speaks to this experience, this interplay, this dialectic, this dynamic of presence and absence, absence and presence. Jesus is present, 
and yet absent. Jesus is absent and yet present. Jesus is present in his absence. His absence makes him present. It evokes his presence. And this ambiguity, this paradox, is not unlike the mystery that we experience when we share in the Lord's Supper at this table. For the Eucharist combines both presence and absence every time we share it. And the link, or perhaps the linchpin, who holds both presence and absence together, who uses the interplay, this dialectic, is none other than the Holy Spirit. Jesus intentionally removes himself in order to make way for us to experience a new, perhaps even deeper manifestation of his presence. His departure paves the way for the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit then comes power, the power of love to upend and transform all things. Jesus says as much, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So you see, the ascension of Jesus marks the beginning of a new age. It's the time of his reign. It paves the way for the time of the Spirit. And therefore, it's also the time of the church. It's the time that the church waits for his return. This time, this between time, time between the times is also, as Acts tells us, the time of the church. Time for the church. And as we know, the church has been at this for a long time. The emphasis upon time, however, should not distract us from something else that is going on here in Acts. For Jesus' ascension up, his translation to a new place, and then the descent of the Spirit upon us, upon these places, means that now we must become conscious of the space of Jesus Christ, the spaces Christ wishes to inhabit, the spaces Christ wishes to enter into, the spaces he wishes to inhabit through his witnesses, through you and me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and in Baltimore and Baltimore County and Howard County and to the ends of the earth. Willie James Jennings, a contemporary theologian who teaches at Yale Divinity School, makes this very important point in his reading of Acts. He says that if the ascended Lord embraces our time as his time to be made known, then he also seeks to walk in the places of this world to announce his life given for the world. This means that we are being called to pay attention to the places especially the unlikely places, the marginal places, the places where the Spirit is now pitching a tent and tabernacling among us and dwelling in us and incarnating the body of Christ in new spaces, in new places. Jesus ascends, Jennings argues, not only to establish presence through absence, but he also now draws his body into the real journeys of his disciples into the world. Jesus goes to heaven for us ahead of us. He goes with and ahead of his disciples into the real places of this world. He is Lord of time, past, present, and future yet walking in our time. And he is Lord of space, here and there and there and there and there, yet taking our spaces and places 
with utmost seriousness. And I think Jennings, who's a wonderful theologian, Jennings is brilliant here and beautifully envisions a way to consider the significance of the ascension. Ascension, Jesus' ascension, he says, is in fact God claiming our space as the sites for our visitation. God's announcement, the announcement of God's desire to come to us. God's desire will be seen in the pouring out of the Spirit in a specific place in order to enter specific places and specific lives. He ascends for our sake, not to turn away from us, Jennings says, but to more intensely focus in on us. So Jesus' ascent occasions the descent of the Spirit, who now continues the mission of God, who now comes even closer to us with a profound intimacy that might even scare us, filling our hearts and enlivening our lives, enlivening our bodies, and then moving our bodies and sending our bodies to different spaces and places all over the world, taking up a space within us and in the spaces between us, between bodies, and then holding us, arranging bodies in new ways and forging bodies into something new, into a new humanity, a new creation, what the New Testament calls ecclesia, church. For we are the objects of God's self-giving, the recipients of a power that wants nothing more than to come close, come close to us and pull us together and bring life. The Spirit has chosen us calls us into church to be engaged in the same work. For the Spirit desires to inhabit the spaces of our lives and draws us together into a new space. The Spirit's aim is always communion. It's always community. It's always koinonia drawing us deeper and deeper and deeper into the life of God, drawing us closer to one another. And this means then that the church is called to share its space with others, even moving into spaces and territories and domains of thought and practice and culture that might even frighten us and disturb us. Spaces we would rather not frequent. And yet the Spirit moves us there. And it seems like we're always playing catch up to wherever the Spirit is going. As we move toward Pentecost next week and the weeks that follow, we will be spending a lot of time in the book of Acts. And one of the strong, steady currents flowing right through the, that amazing text, moving right through Acts, is this belief, this claim, that the Spirit is always pressing disciples. The church, the Spirit is always pressing the church to venture into new spaces, new territories, to cross boundaries of thought and practice and culture to transgress borders, borders between Jew and Gentile, borders separating clean and unclean, male and female, slave and free, to bring us together. And the same is true, no less true today. But the church exists for this work 
The church exists for the mission of God. The church has no other reason for being but for the mission of God. And the church goes wherever the Spirit sends it, sends it to inhabit, bearing witness to what we have discovered in Christ, that God desires to be close to us, to you and to me and to all of creation, that we be one. And the Spirit works to draw us deeper and deeper, all peoples, into a deeper communion that saves us from isolation and all that, that divides and separates us from one another. You might be thinking, that's an impossible task to really realize. Be serious. True? Yet this is the demanding, yet joyful work given to the church. Demanding, if not possible. Because as we know, the forces are legion that right now fight to divide, separate, and isolate us from one another. And from God. And from ourselves. But this is true, nevertheless. There is no way you can deny the, the, the disrupting presence of the Spirit who right now entices us down that still more excellent way of love. For this is why we are here, church. This is why church exists. And it's a privilege, a privilege, friends, to be a part of it all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Christ has called us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. So let us give generously to fulfill that call. You may give online through our website, catonsvillepres.org. If you're not a member or friend of the CPC community, please consider giving to a faith community where you live, a neighborhood church that could use your support at this time. In a time of silence now, let us remember and give thanks for God's gifts to us this week. Time, talent, money, family, relationships, friends, life itself. And then ask yourself, where is the Spirit leading me this week to share my gifts through the work of the church and the love of neighbor?
Let us pray. Holy One, we clap our hands and shout for joy. We give you praise and these offerings. For with Christ ascended by your side, you are God, awesome and most high. Amen. Let us pray for the whole world and everything in it, for there is much need and want, and we, the Church, have been called to be Christ's body in our world today. May, May we, we be Christ's, Christ's body, body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We pray for all the people of the world, especially those who live in want and need. We pray for the nations of the world, especially their leaders, that they may see, understand, and honor the sovereignty of peace and compassion over their own self-interest. May, may we be, be Christ's, Christ's body, body the, fullness the fullness of him who fills all in all. We pray for the earth, and its delicate yet life-giving ecosystem. By the same power through which you resurrected Christ, empower us to restore endangered species, polluted waters, and unclean air. We pray for those who are sick or suffering that they may know your protection and care through our faithful service. May, may we, we be Christ's body, body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We pray for your church and its called and elected leaders. May we all grow in faith and love and know with surety the inheritance and hope to which you have called us. We pray that by the marriage of your grace and our faith, we may serve you and our neighbors. May, may we, we be Christ's body, body, the fullness, fullness of him who fills all in all. Lord, we pray for ourselves, our worries and concerns, the burdens we carry in the silence of our hearts, and trusting you with our hopes and our fears. And we place all of this before you, Holy One. Hear our prayers. Hear our prayers, we pray, for we offer it all in and through Jesus Christ, the risen one, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 
to which God has called you, the glorious inheritance that you have received and God's power that is at work within us. Through Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. <laughs>